right, the same. There it is. Good evening. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you're here with us. Glad that you're here with us. Looking forward to this evening. We're going to continue our study in Genesis. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter uh, 12 and chapter 13. We started the introduction to the life of Abraham, who is not yet Abraham, last week. Uh, he's Abram at this point, and uh, we're going to follow him on his journey of being obedient to the Lord most of the time and seeing what happens even when he's not, which is in some instances probably even more helpful than finding all the things he's done that are successful. But we're going to watch it all the way through. We're going to make it through those two chapters tonight. I'm just going to read sections as we go like I've been doing with some of these bigger pieces since we're going through two whole chapters tonight. So Genesis is where we are. Chapter 12 is where we're going to start. I'm going to be reading ver starting in verse 4, and then we're going to make our way by the time we're done. Unless I get long-winded, which I'm not going to lie, happens sometimes. I know you're aware. Um, unless I get long-winded and have to stop before we get there, we should make it through the end of chapter 13 tonight. So while you're looking for that, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we'll, uh, we'll get straight into our study this evening. Lord, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you for the wonderful meal that we had. Thank you for the hands that prepared that, Lord. I pray that you will bless her. I pray that you will bless us tonight. Now that we've had a good time of fellowship and that we're, we're full and we're comfortable, keep us awake. After that, after that wonderful meal, <laughs> and keep us focused on your word. I pray, Lord, that I will speak well. I pray, Lord, that your people will receive and will put into practice what it is we learn here tonight. We want to be active in what we receive from you and the application of it to our life. We love you. We're grateful for this time. We pray that your purpose will be accomplished in it. In your name, amen. So I'm going to start with uh, Genesis chapter 12. We're going to read verses 4 through 9 to begin, and then we will get into this. So... Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was about 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people he had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem at the Oak of Moreh. I hope I'm pronouncing those right. We're going to make it. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your offspring. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. He built an altar to Yahweh there, and he called on the name of Yahweh. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev. So there's a couple of names in there you probably recognize. Canaan, you probably recognize there. Lot, the nephew of Abram, you probably know from some other stories. Uh, we will get to that eventually as we're going through this study in Genesis. Um, Abram, we know, becomes Abraham. That just hasn't happened yet. Sarai eventually becomes Sarah, which has not yet happened, but that's where we are. And last week we looked at the introduction to this, and now we're watching Abram actually begin his journey toward God's promise. And he starts off extremely well. Abram starts off, and we see in verse 7 that one of the first things he did when he began his journey was he built an altar to the Lord in response to the Lord's promise. God says, I am going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. Your, your descendants will inhabit this land. And Abram starts off by building an altar to the Lord. His first response, and it's just so beautiful. If we could, if we could do this, how much would our life change, our church change, our household change? His first response was to praise the Lord for the promise even before he received anything. He hadn't gotten anything out of this yet. He simply had received the promise of the Lord, and that was enough that he built an altar and began to praise and thank God for what God had done for him. Abram praised the Lord, and the, the promise of the Lord, if you look there in verse 7, it wasn't that God says, I'm going to give you a bunch of money. I'm going to give you a nice big house. He says, I will give this land to your offspring. He's talking about the descendants of Abraham. And Abram, it says, praise, or it says he praised the Lord. He built this altar. He did that even when the Lord's will did not directly benefit him. That's a big deal. I'm real quick to praise the Lord when I see a check in the mail with my name on it. I am real quick to praise the Lord when somebody says, I'm going to pay off the rest of your car loan. I'm real quick to praise the Lord when my wife hands me a brand new guitar and says, I love you, honey. It's real quick when it's something tangible I can put my hands on that I have been praying for, believing God for, or that was a surprise, that's something I thought I'd never have. This is mine, and the Lord did this for me, and yes, I'm excited. Abram got a promise from the Lord that the Lord says, I'm going to give this to your kids. 
There's no indication in there whether Abram will ever even see that take place. He could be long dead. There could be things that I get after my father dies that the Lord promises to me. What reason does my father have? What reason did Abram have to celebrate? It's because of the faithfulness of Abram to serve the Lord and his purpose that he's able to rejoice even when others are benefiting from the Lord in ways that do nothing for him. Because Abram's got a big picture idea of what's happening. He's always thinking about the kingdom of God and something bigger than himself. I will give this land to your offspring is a reason to rejoice, not because it's leave, just because it's leaving a legacy, which it does, but it's got to do with the fact that any time the Lord does something in his kingdom for his people, it is worth celebrating, and all the more so if it's for people that I love. I'm going to say that again. Even if it's for people that I love. I'm going to go a step further than that. Even if it's for people in the kingdom that I don't personally care for, if they are my brothers and sisters in Christ, I should be rejoicing for what God has done for them because the work of God is always worth celebrating. Abram was able to worship and give God glory even when there was nothing of value to him, and he was able to worship and give God glory simply for its own sake because God's work was being done. Abram was faithful not just because of the way he served the Lord in exchange for what he got from the Lord. He was faithful because he was able to praise God for others. We find out here something tremendous about the character of Abram. By and large, we're going to see through the story of Abram that he is an unselfish man. He celebrates several times when things happen for other people or he hears of things that are going to happen in the future. He's not just focused on what's in this for me, what am I going to get out of it, which is very different than our Western idea of Christianity because we're like, I will repent, I will pray, I will come, I will give, I will tithe, I will serve, I will spend my time in the church for the Lord as long as I'm getting messages that I like and the worship leader sings the song that I want and God gives me more money and I see some return on investment or as long as you build that playground for the kids out back of the church that I think that they need or as long as you continue in the ministry that I think you should feeding this group of people or ministering to this particular niche group of folks that I have an interest in as long as I'm getting what I want out of this I'm thrilled to serve the Lord. That's not the example that we see here. Western church has made me the main character, and we've talked many times about how God is the main character. And we find out here Abram even realizes in his own story, in the context of the promise of God, that a huge section of this book of the Bible is devoted to. Abram says, it's still not about me. I'm not the center of the story. He can celebrate and praise God for the sake of others, and we can take a great lesson from that. Something else we learn about Abram is he's concerned about legacy. He's looking at the big picture. He's looking at the big picture in the context of this will be good for the kingdom because it's God's will, but he's also looking at it in terms of his own legacy. There's long-term value in the purpose of God, not just immediate status. Sometimes I want the Lord to do something for me because it puts pastor in front of my name. It gives me a ministry. It gives me a nice car. It's going to put me in a place where then I can be the one to bless some other people. Lord's not concerned with your status. He's concerned with the long-term legacy of his kingdom. There's thousands of years of history in this faith that have absolutely nothing to do with you apart from the fact that you're one of thousands who have served a great God. If we could get that through our heads, it would change the way the church works, the way God is able to work in our life, the way that we can get along with one another, what we could accomplish on the earth for the sake of God. If we would focus on him, Abram's mindset is one of someone that is focused upon the kingdom because he understands that the kingdom stretches beyond time and beyond space and even beyond his own understanding. Abram is less concerned with how does this benefit me and he's focused on God made me a big promise that only could have come from a big God. I hope his purpose gets served by everything that I do. Abram doesn't even do what he does motivated to receive the purpose of God. He's simply serving the Lord in every circumstance. And we're going to find that again and again. Abram does some things in the course of this story, not just the piece we're going to look at tonight, but over the course of the 12 or so chapters where he's the main character, not in God's story, in the book of Genesis. He does some things that aren't necessarily what would seem like they're in his best interest or what best suits him. It's what best serves the Lord. So Abram's looking at long-term value, not immediate status. 
When we look at the promise that he received from the Lord, we looked at that last week in verse 2 where it says God promised to make Abram into a great nation. There's something really interesting in the phrasing of that word. Abram is completely happy to say my children are going to inherit, my descendants are going to inherit. But being the father of a great nation is a big promise, even bigger than what the Lord's going to give to Abram. In one sense, we understand he's talking about Abram's descendants, his actual bloodline becoming a race of people that we know now to be the Israelites. But there's a root word inside of that phrase, great nation, that the Lord uses when he speaks to him. And that root word also is the foundation of the word Gentile. Abram was made a promise from God, and God says, I will make you into a great nation. The nation literally, as the whole word, is the Israelites. But we understand Abram, who becomes Abraham, to be the father of our faith. The bloodline of Israel is Abram, but the spiritual heritage and legacy of all Christianity is Abram's because the promise God made him is not just that I will turn your children into their own country. He says, I will bring the promise of God to bear on the earth through you, and all of us owe that to Abram's faithfulness and selflessness in serving the purpose of God. Galatians 3.29 reinforces this. Paul writes to these people, and he says, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. That's not just a spiritual or a symbolic idea. Literally, great nation has its roots in Gentile and in Israel. It's a beautiful picture. It's amazing to me when you study the Word of God how God doesn't make any mistakes and nothing is by chance. We live today in that promise, whether we were born into the nation of Israel or whether we were spiritually born into God. We live in that promise because Abraham was a kingdom-minded man who thought of God, not of himself, and even within the context of his own promise, he was concerned with legacy rather than immediacy. And from that one place where God made the promise and Abram built the altar, Abram did what we saw him do already once before. He moved on. We looked at those first four verses. It says God made Abram a promise and Abram did as God said. What was the first word? Go. Now we see again, Abram has built this altar in response to the word of the Lord. And now it says Abram moved on again. We looked at that last week, that word go, because God always says to go. You never get the promise of God. You don't see the success and the fulfillment of the word of the Lord if you sit in one place and just wait for him to serve you like he's the butler or the waiter at the fancy restaurant. There's always a need to move if we expect to experience and receive the promise of God. We've got to go where he said, we've got to be where he says be, and we've got to be in the mode of receiving, in the attitude and heart of being ready to receive when God dispenses it. Abram did this. He responded, and he went, and he continued to go as long as God continued to say go. And we get into verse 8, and we're starting to look at where Abram moves. It says he went on through the hill country. Now, that's not easy going. I had an interesting conversation with my son this afternoon in the car on the way home from, uh, from school just because I was curious what he would say. I said, when you think about the country of Israel, and you think about all the stories in the Bible in the Old Testament, what do you think of? And he says, I think of dry, flat desert, like the beach, but without an ocean. <laughs> like, Generally, we do think of that. We think of the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years, and we, we think of dead and dry. And my son even went so far as to talk about, you know, there were some mesas, so the, the hills must have been like big piles of sand or big brown rocks with flat stuff on top. And as he was describing it, what I thought, because I'm old, is like, you know, the, the old Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons. Like, that was kind of what I had in mind when I'm thinking about what my son is describing Israel looks like. But there are mountains and hills mentioned several times. When it says Abraham or Abram moved in, on into hill country, it was not just some little sand dunes. It did not look like, you know, R2-D2 and C-3PO trying to make their way through Star Wars. We're talking about a, a country that actually has some difficult terrain. Israel has mountain ranges. In fact, the, one of the lowest mountains there is just shy of 2,000 feet above sea level, and the highest one is, al is almost 4,000 feet. They're not tiny mountains. They're not the Rockies. They're not quite Mount Mitchell, which we have here in North Carolina. But Mount, I mean, Mount Mitchell is not too much taller than that. I think it's just shy of 6,000 at the highest point. So 
we're looking at some substantial mountains here, here, not just a nice stroll through the hill country. Abram responded and he went and it was not easy going. And those mountains, if you look at pictures, you can pull those up on Wikipedia and there's, lo there's lots of scrubs and lots of low plants and lots of rocks and it's actually difficult climbing to think that he would go into hill country and yet Abram said, I'll go. He goes through difficult terrain and while he's on this difficult journey, he's left the altar behind. We get to verse 8. He goes through hill country and it says at this point, or it says that he pitched a tent in a couple of places, or in between a couple of places. Bethel and Ai are the two towns. And in between those two towns, Abram builds an altar again to talk to the Lord, which is significant in pointing out because he's going to do this frequently throughout Genesis because he's got a habit of talking to the Lord. He's not just waiting until he gets to a mountaintop moment to call on God and celebrate and be excited. Thank you, Lord, for the great thing you've done. He's also not just building altars of desperation like a 911 call in the valley in the dark place because something's coming for him. Oh, God, come bail me out. I need rescued. It says in between on this journey, he builds an altar. Because too many of us want to just celebrate the high spots or call out to God for rescue in the valley, but there's a whole lot more journey that happens in between there. The majority of the journey is between the special moments and the desperate moments. It's not that we camp out and one or the other, we have a series of them. If they were all special or they were all desperate, we wouldn't know the difference when something out of the ordinary showed up. How would we recognize the Lord if every single moment was extraordinary? Why would we need this concept of being faithful like Abraham was if there wasn't going to be something to be faithful through? It's easy to just celebrate when everything is easy. It's easy to call out for help when everything is difficult. What's hard is that journey in between where I just have to walk out the day to day and it doesn't seem like anything extraordinary is happening. Abram had a habit of going to the Lord. And this is even more poignant when we look at the locations where he is. It says he's between Bethel and Ai. Bethel means the house of God. It's a, it's a place that is associated with praise and with promise and with celebration. The tribe of Judah is known for being there. And a lot of the things that happen in that tribe takes place in and around this, this area of Bethel. The house of God, the highest, closest place to him you could imagine. And the other place, Ai, means a heap of ruins, destruction and desolation. And in the middle of those two places, that's where Abram says, I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to put an altar here. The Lord and I need to talk. It's important. There's a lot more days, a lot more spaces, a lot more miles, a lot more ground, and a lot more time between those locations, between celebration and destruction. And those are the places where it's most important for us to praise. Those are the places where it's most important for us to speak to God. Those are the places where we're establishing a relationship with him that can survive the mountaintop and the valley alike. If you've not built some time into the relationship, when something goes wrong, you'll be faster to bail. And when something goes right, you'll be slow, if you even remember at all, to give credit to the one that got you there. The relationship has to be built in between. Otherwise, we can't survive either the difficulty or the success that would come. And in verse 9, we see it says, Abraham journeyed by stages. We have a, a friend, my wife and I, who says that she hates road trips, especially when you get right to the middle of them, because at that point, Especially if you're going to be in the car for four, five, six hours. You're too far from home for it to make sense to turn around and go back. But you're too far from where you're going to be excited about getting there yet. Abram journeyed by stages. And he was not overly focused upon the beginning and the end. He was focused on the process. Even the father of our faith took the journey towards God, toward God's promise one day at a time. One piece. One step. One section. We made it through this day. Thank you, God. We're going to make it through this night. Thank you, God. And we're going to do another day tomorrow. I don't have to worry about the next 10 years of my life. 
These first few verses are a beautiful picture of Abraham beginning a journey and beginning it well. Build an altar. Thank the Lord. Take it a step at a time. Celebrate and communicate with him all the way there, no matter what we run into. Make sure that it, me on this journey is not what's important. God and where we're going is what's important. He does so well here, but like every other story of every single human being, even when we start well, we start to see flaws and humanity come in. And in these next couple of verses, I'm about to read verses 10 through 20, we're going to watch Abram make the first big mistake of this trip. And it snowballs real fast. Let's read this together. Starting in verse 10. There was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine in the land was severe. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, Look, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me but let you live. Please, say you're my sister so it will go well for me because of you, and my life will be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful, and Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh so that the woman was taken to Pharaoh's household. He treated Abram well because of her, and Abram acquired flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, male and female slaves and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh went, or Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, Why have you done this to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you lie and say to me, This is my sister, so that I took her as my wife? Now, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all he had. There is a lot to unpack there. Abram, who started his journey well, finds himself in a position of difficulty. There's a famine in the land. I'm hungry. There's a nation over here next door, not necessarily on the way to where God's sending me, but they seem to have plenty of food. Let's go there and take care of ourselves. Mistake number one, God made you a promise. Get through day by day. Talk to him on the way. Nowhere in this does he even consult God about going off course to go and go find provisions somewhere else. There's a famine, and Abram decides to take his own care and his own prosperity into his own hands. Mistake number one. And we see in verse 11, Abram suddenly becomes aware of some things around him. In fact, he's, he's a smart guy. Abram married up. You know what that means, right? Fellas, she's better than you. She's prettier than you. She's nicer than you. She does everything better than you. You don't deserve her. She is a prize. All men should know this about the woman that you are with, okay? Not only did he marry up and he doesn't deserve her and she's better and she's a prize and I am so fortunate and lucky to have her, Sarai's legitimately hot, okay? Abram says... I know that you're beautiful. And the undertone of that could very easily be read way prettier than I should have landed. I, I don't know how I pulled this. But here I am. And he says, these people are going to see you. And it's going to be obvious to them that you're hot. And I'm not. And even if I am okay looking, they're going to want somebody that looks like you. Because who in their right mind wouldn't? Because we all married up, fellas. Okay? All right. So in verse 12, it says, Abram goes to Egypt, and he's already off course. He's already decided he's going to take his own fortune and his own destiny and his own provision into his own hands. And then he heads toward Egypt, and the first thing he experiences is fear. They're going to kill me because they're going to want you. The verse says, they will kill me and let you live. So now he's off course. Now he's not in the provision of God. He's taking care of himself, and now he's afraid. You see how quickly this is adding up and how ugly it's about to get. So in order 
to be able to continue on his course doing what he thinks is best without consulting the Lord. And in order to put himself at ease so he's not afraid anymore, he decides to lie. Are you counting? you keeping score? You got your card ticked for this one. And then he's not content just to lie himself. He's got to make sure everybody with him is on board so he gets his wife to lie as well. Fellas, you're responsible for your wives. You'll be accountable for what you have asked them or made them do. We'll learn about that later. There's some more story about this. But for now, I'm just going to put a pin in that. So now one sin getting off course and taking care of my own business and not consulting the Lord has become five very quickly, and they haven't even really gotten into Egypt yet. They haven't even made it to the forbidden land, and Abram has already made a lot of mistakes. And then we see this horrific thing happens. Exactly what he said. They're going to find you beautiful. We're going to pretend that you're not mine. And in verses 15 through 16, that's exactly what happens. And because of the lie, Sarai ends up in Pharaoh's house. A little farther down, it says he took her as his wife. Abram took camels and land and servants and provisions in exchange for her. Abram is now benefiting from the lies by turning his hot wife into a whore. He sold her to keep himself safe. And Pharaoh taking her as a wife means only one thing. There's a reason we left the kids out of today. Sometimes it's a grown-up conversation because this is the Bible and it's not a kid's story. Back in that day, there didn't have to be the big wedding ceremony. What made you a wife was when you had performed a wifely duty for the fellow who took you. Do I need to say that in any other way? Are we all on the same page, okay? And Abram profited from allowing that to happen. So he's left God's provision and taken his life in his hands. He's fearful. He's lying. He got his wife to lie. Now he has sold her into a lifestyle, and he's profiting from it. That's the hideous face of what sin and being out of the will of God does to everybody that enters into it. It may not be the same progression for you, but what begins as something simple and legitimate and obvious and it's going to work out fine becomes a wreck really fast when you see it to the end. What starts off as I'm hungry, here's an answer, becomes I'm afraid. Lying now seems like the best option. Now we can't back out of the lie. we got to see this through to the end. And then Abram's in a place where he's watched this go to its logical, God help us, conclusion. And he could sit back very easily and say, well, man, this worked out great. I mean, I don't have my hot wife right here anymore, but I got all this stuff. God didn't strike me dead. We got away with it. I'm not hungry anymore. I'm not scared anymore. And look at all this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you say my collection's complete? Right? God didn't strike me dead, and I actually seem to be doing well. I can live like this for a while, and I can live good. You know what? Maybe, maybe we didn't even really do anything wrong. Maybe this was God's plan to bless us all along. And suddenly, we've left the presence of God, and now we're calling wickedness the provision of God. That's blasphemy. When we first start out into sin, we don't plan to necessarily see it through to such a wicked, horrible conclusion. And we often don't even see how bad it is. We don't notice the absurdity of it all as we're descending into that pit. But it's obvious wickedness to anybody that's watching from the outside in. Abram's going, seems to work out, seems to have worked out okay. We're sitting here going, you lied, you made your wife a prostitute, and now you're happy living with just a few extra camels? Really? 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 
And we thought that looked pretty bad from where we're sitting. But now it gets worse. Actually, it gets worse for Abram at this point. He didn't realize how bad it was before because he's sitting pretty. But by verse 17, it says, The Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with plagues because of Abram's deception. Abram's about to get found out. And there is nothing worse than thinking you have gotten away with some sort of wickedness and you've been coasting on it long enough that you're not even thinking about it anymore. You're comfortable in it. It's normal. You've become desensitized. You're not even sure that what you've done is wrong. And all of a sudden you get confronted with, confronted with it. Just because we don't see the consequences of sin does not mean that we aren't visiting them upon other people and they're not lingering there. Pharaoh is upset and rightfully so. Because look at this from his perspective. Suddenly his house is cursed and it's not because of anything he did, he did wrong. Those curses are on Abram's head because he lied and descended so far into sin that he then began visiting the consequences of his sin on other innocent people. And this is the father of God's people. No one is above this. This is not beyond anyone. You can never say, this won't happen to me. This is what sin does to us, and this is where Abram finds himself. And we have to realize when we're talking about sin and its consequences, the consequences of our actions, especially, especially when we represent Christ, are farther reaching than just ourselves. Thinking I got away with it is the worst thought you could possibly have because you have no idea what kind of havoc you have wreaked on the people around you with your evil. And that's not just the situation for somebody with a title. Oh yeah, because he's a pastor and he sinned. That looks terrible. No, you're a Christian and you sinned and the people around you that are watching are aware. Whether those people are Christians or not, people are watching. This is not just about people with titles. This is true for anybody that represents God. Because as a reflection of Him, everything that you do is about shaping the opinions of people that don't believe or reinforcing the belief of the people that do believe. You're, you're serving as an example for people that are somewhere on their journey establishing their relationship with Him and maybe aren't as mature as you are. You may or may not be influencing people that are on the fence about whether they actually want to buy into this faith and this lifestyle or not. And the consequences of your actions are resting upon those watchers and those decisions. Now, they have to answer for what they do, but your influence as a child of God is unmistakable, and he will call you into account for it. If we would take seriously the idea of that silly little Christian phrase that, oh, you may be the only Jesus some people ever see. If we would take that seriously and fully consider the impact of how true that is, we'd spend a lot less time testing the fences of God's tolerance for our sin and a whole lot more time trying to establish ourselves as faithful in His sight. We would take it seriously and realize the consequences of my actions are being visited upon other people. And sometimes that has to do with their eternity because it's influencing the way they see God himself. Take it seriously. Don't look at what you can get away with. We need to find out how faithful we can be because the consequences are bigger than whether God punished me today or not. Verses 18 through 20 of this passage we just read, Pharaoh discovers the truth and he sends Abram away. He says, I see what you have done. Why would you do this to me? Take your wife, take your stuff and get out. If the story were pretty and clean, that would be the end of it. But we've got to consider all of history because this is not just a pretty Bible story for children, remember. This is a historical account. We've got to take all of the rest of time up until the very minute that I'm speaking right now into account. For the remainder of the Old Testament, we see contention between God's people and the nation of Egypt that goes back to the father of our faith, lying to Pharaoh about his wife. The ramifications of our misdeeds are far greater than whether or not we got caught. They're way bigger than whether or not there is going to be grace for this sin or not. Oh, that's covered under grace, brother. It's going to be fine. But what damage did you do in the process 
of saying, grace will cover it, it'll be fine. The ramifications, the consequences are far greater than just how blessed I am and how much God promised me so it'll be okay. We're not just going to smooth it all over like peanut butter, like icing on the cake that's going to make the divot in the top less visible. Abram sowed bad seed in the relationship with Pharaoh, and that bad seed is still a point of contention today between the entire nation of Israel and the entire kingdom of God. Excuse me, nation of Egypt and the kingdom of God. That country is still not a Christian country, and they still don't get along with the Jewish people or people that share our faith. Thousands of years of ugliness and mistrust and spiritual disillusionment with the God of the universe that you can trace back to Abraham thinking he got away with something. It's so much bigger. Your calling and the promise that God made you is not an excuse for recklessness or carelessness or selfishness in how you walk out your faith. Your calling and your anointing are a greater cause not to seek things like privileges. I'm a good Christian brother. Can you hook me up on that? Can I get the preacher discount on my breakfast this morning? Your calling and your anointing are all the more reason that you should not seek to be treated special. You should not be looking for extra liberties and things you can get away with. You should not be behaving as if you're entitled to something because the world is watching and you're influencing the opinion of God in the lives of those people. I don't want anything to do with Christians or their God because that guy's always trying to scam me for a couple extra bucks. He wants me to build him a house for free. He wants me to fix his car for nothing. He never tips when he comes to breakfast. Your calling, your anointing, your position is greater cause to be as Christ-like as possible, not to be reckless, careless, or the exception to anything. That's the problem we have with cheap grace just in general in the Western church. We have this concept of grace where we say it doesn't cost anything, and because of grace it's all going to be okay. But God's forgiveness, yes, it, it erases the eternal consequences for sin and the eternal consequences for human error. We know that. God's grace satisfied the price demanded by God's law, but it did so at a great cost. That grace doesn't mean that I've got permission to sin or that, that, I'm, that I'm the exception to any rule. It doesn't mean that I have a right to behave unrighteously or push the limits or stretch the boundaries. It also doesn't mean that there will be no natural, temporary, yet devastating human consequences for my actions on earth. The Lord may have forgiven me for my sin, but there's still a fallen world where I committed some fallen actions and it works the way it works and it's going to produce what it produces. When we're reborn by the Spirit of God, every word and every interaction and every decision that we will make produces consequences on the scale of eternity in our natural lives. And Abram's actions in this situation, both the good ones and the evil ones, have produced results that have lasted thousands of years. And it is no different for you and for me. What he did for the Lord, the faithfulness that we are going to see more of, that we've seen a piece of already... That makes him the father of our faith because God honored his promise because God is faithful and Abram was faithful to the Lord. But what he did out of fear and deceit and selfishness has shaped the spiritual and political future of an entire culture of people all the way to today. Both of them, the impact of Christianity upon the world and the impact of Abram's sin upon the Middle East are still seen and felt right now. This stuff matters. It's important. So Abram makes some terrible mistakes. And he's in a terrible situation. He's finally cast out of Egypt, which is probably the best thing that could have happened to him. And sometimes that's the best thing that happens to us. Our sin finds us out, and the people that find out that we're wicked don't want to have anything to do with us anymore. That's probably a good thing when the wicked people don't want you. So Abram gets sent on his way, and we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 13, where he's leaving Egypt. Egypt. I'm going to read the first four verses of this. Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, 
Sound familiar? He was on that journey before until he detoured into taking care of himself and making a wreck of all of history. He, his wife, and all that he had and lot with him. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. He went by stages from the Negev to Bethel to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had formerly been to the site where he had built the altar. And Abram called on the name of Yahweh there. Abram leaves Egypt in disgrace. He leaves the site of his sins and his failures. And all of the riches that he's accumulated go with him. And every single one of them is a reminder of his failure and stupidity. Of his brokenness and his humanity. And with nowhere else to go, what does he do? He journeys back to the altar that he built in that place in between blessing and desolation. And he seeks the Lord. That is a testament to Abraham's faithfulness that would be just as good a lesson as anything else that we have learned. Because even in his worst, most wicked, most dark, most impactful failure, Abram did not stop pursuing the Lord. I have messed up. I am going back to the place where I can talk to him again and make right my path. Faithfulness. I said this last week, and I'm going to say it several times as we look at the life of Abram. Faithfulness is not about perfection. It's about persistence. He's returned to this place, and I'm going to read verses 5 through 9. Now Lot, remember Abram's nephew, who was still traveling with Abram. Gosh, he watched all this happen. His nephew watched this. Lot, who was traveling with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents, but the land was unsta- unable to support them as long as they stayed together, for they had so many possessions that they could not stay together. And there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were living in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Please, let's not have quarreling between you and I, or between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, since we are relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Separate from me. If you go to the left, I will go to the right, and if you go to the right, I will go to the left. Now we're beginning to see something Again, with Abram, as Abram is seeking the Lord, he goes back to this place, back to the altar, prays to the Lord. And in the midst of this, it becomes obvious to him. You might even say his wisdom is beginning to return to him. It reali- he realizes that Lot, that we know is traveling with him, they can't continue together. Lot's flocks and families and servants had grown. So had Abram's. They had grown so much that Lot and Abram had outgrown each other. The land could not sustain them both. Sometimes it is the nature of relationships, even between Christians and in the kingdom of God, that this has come to an end. I can't continue to mentor you. The call on our life is different. The season that we're in is no longer the same. Before this becomes a point of contention, we need to separate so that we can remain on good terms with one another as Christians. Abram recognizes this, and in his his wisdom, he releases Lot to pursue the Lord and his own future. It is the wisdom of a good leader. It is the wisdom of a good follower of Christ. It is the wisdom of a good disciple to recognize when it is time to bless and release one another. Not curse and fight and, sp- and part ways angry. To bless and release one another. Now culturally the situation here is Abram is responsible for Lot. We talked about that. I'm not going to re- re- revisit all of that tonight. But because of the family obligation that was here, Lot more than likely never would have left Abram. Culturally the obligation was to the father figure and he would have stayed But for Abram to have kept Lot under his thumb would have caused the quarrels that were already happening to escalate and it would have damaged the relationship. It would have come to the point 
that it would have been a contentious or an angry separation that would not benefit God or benefit either of these men or benefit the kingdom or the people as a whole. Abram was wise enough and trusted the Lord enough to know that I can be in relationship with this brother, with this nephew, from a distance. I can mentor him and I can love him from wherever I am. I don't have to have him right here with me. And I don't need him as a servant. And I don't need the status. Remember I told you, Abram is more concerned with the long-term legacy than the immediate status. I don't need yet one more person here to make me feel self-important and to serve me. I can let him go and release him in love and do what needs to be done in his life in love from a distance. The time has come for our walk together to end and for him to pursue the Lord on his own in the same way that I am. It's a beautiful picture of how this should happen and far too often does not in the church and in relationships with people. Let's look at verses 10 through 13. Lot looked out and saw the entire Jordan Valley as far as Zoar and was what, saw it was well watered everywhere like the Lord's garden and the land of Egypt. And this was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Heard, you probably know those names, but we're not there yet. So Lot chose the entire Jordan Valley for himself, and then Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, and Lot lived in the cities of the valley and set up his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were evil, sinning greatly against the Lord. Lot looks down, and he chooses the Jordan Valley because it looks beautiful. It's got water. The grass is green. The sun is shining. It looks like a nice place. It seems like it's going to support my family and, and its flocks. Everything in it looks beautiful. But we, we know the story because you've certainly recognized Sodom and Gomorrah as town you've, a town you've heard the stories of before, but that hasn't happened yet. It even says here that the Lord had not yet destroyed them. So for now in this context, all we really see is that Lot made a poor choice. He chose something that looked beautiful, but that even Lot and Abram were aware the men in Sodom are wicked. It was right there in verse 13. Lot chooses the appearance of beauty and prosperity, and he ignores the wickedness. The passage here doesn't say why. We simply know that's what happened. They were aware it was there, but Lot said it looks beautiful enough. I can, I can ignore that. And we do that a lot ourselves. We only see the good in the situation. We don't want to acknowledge what's a mess. And sometimes we see what's so good to the point that we say we're either going to ignore or we just don't acknowledge at all that there's wickedness. We'll make excuses for wickedness if we can say there's enough good in something. We will dismiss that little bit of wickedness and say, I know that's there, but that doesn't affect me. I can say no to that. I gave an illustration to the high school kids when I was, uh, I, I brought them some cookies last week. Made sure everybody had their cookie, make sure they're biting into their cookie. And then I said, these are, these are organic, they're wholesome, they're wonderful. I know there's, there's this lady that works in the town where I live and she makes them homemade from scratch. Those cookies used to be a pile of cocoa and sugar and oats. And now they're those delicious things that you're eating right now wholesome, organic, wonderful for you. Even her special ingredient is organic. She gets it from her own backyard. She has this little schnauzer puppy, and she just goes behind him and picks up the little nuggets every time he goes out. And she just puts, I mean, in one ba every batch of cookies, she only puts like a tablespoon. It's just the tiniest bit of something nasty in there, and really that's probably what makes it so good and so enjoyable. I wish you could have seen how green 33 teenagers became. <laughs> Obviously, I was kidding. But even the tiniest little bit of wickedness taints, contaminates everything. We can't look at something that's beautiful and say, that little bit won't bother me. It's not going to get in me. It's not going to bother me or not going to affect me. I, I can ignore that because look at how much good there is. It doesn't work that way. And yet that's what Lot does when he picks what's ahead of him. We're going to see later how that goes for Lot, but that's Lot's story. Right now, we're looking at Abram. Abram allowed Lot to make his decision. This is often the hardest decision for leaders, for Christians, for parents to make. 
when you allow someone that you love, that you have mentored, that you have raised to make their own decision because they have reached the point that it is time to release them and bless them. When we talk about the faithfulness of Abram, we realize in this situation, Abram had to trust the Lord. We have to trust the Lord, even in how he's going to handle others and their decisions. Not my circus, not my monkeys. That's not a bad attitude as the Lord has said, release them and they are of age to make that decision. Abram knew it was time to separate and once Abram released Lot, he had to trust in everything that he had invested in Lot. He had to trust in everything that Lot had seen, good, bad, or indifferent in Abram's life. And Abram, most importantly, had to trust that God had his hand on Lot as he released him. Abram had to trust Lot to take responsibility for his choices and trust the Lord to take care of Lot, even if Lot made some bad decisions. Trusting God, even in difficulty, even in the lives of those that we love and we wish we could play the God in their life and stop it, which we're not called to do. Trusting God in those situations is the mark of a faithful servant of an almighty God, and Abraham was faithful even in this. And we see in these last few verses, I'm going to read verses 14 through 17. After Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, Look from the place where you are. Look north and south, east and west, for I will give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up and walk around the land through its length and width, for I will give it to you. After Lot separated from him. The Lord spoke. The Lord has given you some wisdom and some insight, and he has told you from day one, go, this is the promise. Abram had to put into practice what the Lord had already invested in him before the Lord would speak again. Once Abram returned to the place where God told him to be, and once Abram got into the presence of God, and once Abram used the wisdom and knowledge that God had given him to make godly decisions, then God responded. We don't always need some new revelation or some new word or some new promise. Sometimes we need to put to use what God has already given us, and we need to do it in the place where God called us to be. We don't need to be yearning for some other place or some new word. Do with what he gave you in the place where you are. And if you're not in the place where he told you to be, take what he gave you and get to that place with it and use it there. Don't try to apply it somewhere else because you will not get the same results. When God spoke to Abram, it was because Abram had put those things into practice in the place that they were supposed to be put in. And look what he did. He reminded Abraham what the promise was. I'm going to make your descendants live here. They're going to be numerous. Look around this land. Walk around this land. Go. Reminds me a lot of another story we've taught recently when Jesus and Peter have a conversation on the beach. Peter has denied Jesus prior to his crucifixion. Jesus has been crucified. He's risen. He's meeting with the disciples. And what does he do? He reminds Peter of who he called him to be. And releases him back into the promises he's already made him. God does this with Abram here. Abram, this is the promise. This is who I called you to be. Go do that instead of what you've been doing. He even says it again there in verse 17. Get up and walk around. That promise required action even when he reiterated it. Go, walk around. Become active and comfortable in the process of fulfilling the promise of God. I'm going to say that again. Become active and comfortable in the process of of fulfilling the promise. Not just active and comfortable in the promise, in the process of fulfilling it. Whether it's exciting or whether it's difficult or whether it's intimidating or whether it's thrilling to you, be active and comfortable in the process of becoming the promise. And we see again in verse 18, Abraham moved his tent and went to live near the oaks of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Like we saw last week in 12.4. Abram responded and did as the Lord said. He moved. And when he arrived at the next place, like he's already done a couple of times, while he moved in stages from where I am to where God wants me to be, toward the promise, he built an altar 
to the Lord. Again, we're looking at a man who is faithful in his service to the Lord in the process of his journey toward what God promised him. I'm going to end there tonight. We'll pick it back up next week. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this evening for this message. I thank you for the opportunity to see your word in this way. I thank you for the example of Abram. And I thank you for your example in his life. I pray that we would take something from this and apply it to our own lives in a way that betters us, betters our relationship with you, and most importantly, betters your kingdom and brings you glory upon the earth. Keep us safe as we go. Bring us back at your appointed time. We pray and ask all these things in your name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for being here tonight. You are all dismissed. Have a good evening.